विन फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ हाई एवरी वन इट्स माई प्लेजर टू इंट्रोड्यूस दिस जॉइंट एसी एंड ओसी प्रोग्राम on early onset scoliosis you know as a prelude for the asicon 24 uh, and we have a great you know faculty who are making time for this program i'd like to ask dr chahal to initiate proceedings thank you uh oh, good morning thanks arjun uh, uh, on the behalf of the association of spine surgeons of india we welcome to you a joint outreach session with the pediatric orthopedic society of india it's a wonderful society on a personal note since i am from manipal and i have been associated with all the stalwarts from dr benjamin joseph to dr shriram and vijay shriram is a very close friend and my first uh, poster presentation in any conference was in posi delhi in 1999 and uh, it's a wonderful society doing excellent work and this program has been designed in such a way that it benefits all of us this is a very very important topic touched by all orthopedicians in their practice so i welcome you all to a wonderful session good morning to everybody on behalf of the bombay spine society which is the host society for the asicon 2024 i invite all the speakers and all the delegates to this session on early onset scoliosis It is a very dear subject to all spine surgeons as well as the pediatric uh, orthopedic surgeons who deal with uh, deformities. This is, in fact, uh, ASICON before the ASICON because these outreach programs are so nicely curated that it will have wealth of information which will be available to the delegates even after the event because it is being recorded. I uh, hand over the proceedings without much delay to Dr. Johari to start the program. i would request uh, dr alvari karuji who is the president of posi to say a few words before i formally take on the program yes yeah, sorry so i didn't sir. see him. sorry i didn't see him in the no yeah. worries ketan welcome good welcome alvari good morning everyone i am alvari karuji i am the president of the pediatric orthopedic society of india and along with my uh, uh, co-host uh, and secretary dr viraj shingade I welcome all of you to this joint webinar between the Association of Spine Surgeons of India, the Bombay Spine Society, and POSI. The vision of ASI and POSI are closely aligned, and that is to uh, provide educational opportunities to its members in the form of conferences, webinars, CMEs, fellowships, and scholarships for our younger trainees, with the ultimate aim of uh, improving the quality of care we provide to our patients. and in in this essence i feel that this webinar is the right step in that direction we have a whole bunch of uh, wonderful faculty who have spared their time and their expertise uh, to share their knowledge with all of us and uh, on behalf of uh, posi i welcome all of you to this uh, excellent webinar uh, i hand it over to dr ashok johari for introducing the moderators and the speakers for this session thank you all very much Well, thank you, Alaric. Uh, thank you to both the ASSI and uh, POSI for hosting this webinar on a subject you know which is very dear to my heart. We're going to be speaking on early onset scoliosis, and uh, talking of early onset scoliosis, it's a problem of the growing spine. This is a child I saw end of nineteen eighty seven when she was born, you know, with a cob angle of thirty degrees, and by the time I saw her a second time in nineteen eighty nine. a year more than a little more than a year's interval you know the curve magnitude became 86 degrees you know and this is not unusual you know you have these patients this is a 5 and a half year old child with a progressive deformity the scoliosis measures 115 degrees the kyphosis is 70 degrees you know so horrendous looking spine young age how do we treat you know progressive curves things getting worse what are our treatment options you know the deformities of the young spine can be due to a number of causes which are mentioned on the left so early onset scoliosis is a miscellany of different ages of onset and different etiologies 
Spinal deformity present before the age of 10, regardless of its etiology, falls under this bracket, you know, that is early onset scoliosis. Why is this different or distinctive? Because it has an increased risk of progression, increased cardiovascular compromise, increased morbidity and mortality, and treatment is difficult. There are many strategic factors which the speakers will, will outline. I just summarize these, you know, right from age and etiology to the physical status to number of surgeries, psychology and the quality of life. All these are involved, you know. The numerous speakers today are going to sort of enlighten you on these aspects. So we will be starting with Dr. Ashish Ranade. He is going to be speaking on pathogenesis of early onset scoliosis. Then radiological features and MRI findings in early onset scoliosis by Dr. Narish Babu. Casting, indications and technique, again, a very important form of treatment in early onset scoliosis, Dr. Sham Kishan. Growing rods, when and how, Dr. Salil Lupasni. Hemivertebrectomy and fusion, Dr. Ajoy Shetty. Complications of surgery, Dr. Abhay Nene. And then a special category that is syndromic scoliosis, Special Considerations by Dr. Bhavuk Gur. Now, after all this, to apply what we have learned, we will have some case discussions and Dr. Arjun Dhavle and Dr. Naresh are going to lead the case discussion. Now, a brief introduction to the speaker. I'll just run through these slides. Let me tell you, they're all distinguished personalities in their fields and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce all of them. Dr. Ashish Ranade is based in Pune. He has had a fellowship in pediatric orthopedic and scoliosis. I think he worked with Randall Betts long ago. He is consultant orthopedic surgeon at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and a visiting pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Bharti Vidyapit Medical College Hospital, Pune. He is also author of a book on infection, musculoskeletal infections. So he will be talking to us on patho pathogenesis um, of uh, early onset scoliosis. Dr. Narish Babu is Director and Chief Spine Surgeon of Malika Spine Center in Guntur. Again, a very applauded uh, spine surgeon with numerous national and international awards and fellowships. He is Secretary of the Association of Orthopedic Surgeons of South uh, Indian States and of the Spine Society of South India and has held many other positions. So he is going to speak on investigations and MRI, etc. Sham Kishan, a very own um, boy, MBBS from Jipmer and then uh, worked at the State GS Medical College in KM Hospital, Mumbai, before he moved on to the US to establish a shining career. Well, he's director now of pediatric orthopedic surgery, trauma and scoliosis in Dallas, Texas, and professor of orthopedic surgery at Burnett School of Medicine. His special interests are pediatric spine deformity, early onset scoliosis, and thoracic insufficiency, limb deformities and fractures. Dr. Salil Lupasni is Professor of Clinical Orthopedic Surgery and Director of Pediatric Orthopedics and Scoliosis Clinical Fellowships. He is also Director of the 3D Innovations Lab. He is based at San Diego at Radish Children Hospital and he is Professor at the University of California, San Diego. He is going to speak to us on growing rods. Dr. Ajay Shetty works at the Ganga Hospital, is senior consultant there, and is currently the AO Spine India chairperson and chair of the Education Committee of ASSI and also of the Asia Pacific Spine Society. He holds many editorial positions. He is editor, associate editor of the Journal of Orthopedics and Journal of Musculoskeletal Disorders, and also on the editorial boards of the Asian Spine Journal and the Indian Spine Journal. Abba is a well-known personality in Mumbai. This handsome person, besides spine surgery, has many other interests. You see the last part of the slide, it says moonlight, whatever that means, you know, with classic rock band, the flunkies. He enjoys cross-country cycling, mountaineering, and road running. He's a dynamic spine surgeon, a very busy spine surgeon, actually, and was AO Spine Asia Pacific Chair and AOSAP Educator of the Year in 2018, connected with many hospitals in Mumbai. Dr. Bhavu Garg, who will be joining us as Professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Ames, New Delhi. Again, a very academic person with numerous academic awards, fellowships, and publications and presentations. And he is Chair 
of the Secret Spine Committee. His interests are complex spine deformities, and he has had many original contributions and innovations. He is associate editor, Indian Journal of Orthopedics, Journal of Clinical Orthopedics and Trauma, and the Nash Journal. So now uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Ashish Ranade, who is going to be speaking to us. He's the first speaker. Ashish, over to you. Good morning. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so I'll be briefly discussing pathophysiology of the early onset scoliosis. So as discussed earlier by sir, it's a, it's a problem. And we try to look at some of the normal developments of the spine and pulmonary function and discuss how EOS affects respiratory function and explain mechanisms by which the lung function is affected. So as we all know, it is more than 10 degree curve in a child at less than 10 years of age. The etiologies are varied and they contribute to the pathologies and it has effects on the development of the chest wall and the cardiopulmonary function. And it is just not an orthopedic problem and there is more to it and um, it's a complex scenario. So why, why do we need to know about the pathophysiology? All of us agree that we need to correct the deformity when it's a progressive deformity, but fusion surgery is not an option and growth rods, they, they have their own set of problems. So the pathophysiology will help us in choosing the correct treatment when uh, we take it into consideration. So etiologies are varied, congenital and neuromuscular, um, and it is taken into consideration because the rate and the risk of deformity progression will depend on the etiology of the scoliosis. And it's also the part of the, the CEOS classification system, in addition to uh, the Cobb angle and the maximum total kyphosis and the progression modifier. So brief overview of the spine growth. The growth of the thoracic spine is maximum rapid during first five years of life. Then it decreases, slows down a little bit, and then again, there is uh, the adults and growth spurt. Um, the alveoli, they multiply rapidly during first two years and continue to do so at slightly uh, slower rate up to eight years of age and thereafter the growth of the alveoli cease. So if we look at the growth of the spine from T1 to T12 segment, at birth it is approximately 12 centimeters, and this increases to about 18 centimeters by 5 years, goes up to 22 centimeters by 10 years, and in adult it is approximately 80, 28 centimeters. So this 22 centimeters of T1 to T12 se uh, segment Many authorities, they consider this as probably a point where they can consider uh, whether to go with growth system or definitive system. When we take into consideration this growth of the spine with other parameters, as, as shown by work out of uh, France by Demiglio and all, even though the growth of the sitting height or the thoracic spine is maximal during five years, the, the thoracic volume is not uh, matching that growth. So approximately one third of thoracic volume is achieved by five years. And the T1-S1 volume is also approximately 35%. So this needs to be taken into consideration while planning treatment. So pulmonary growth is non-linear. The alveolar capillary prolification is maximal during first two years. And uh, here is a chart here is when the total number of alveoli against age, um, we can see that it is maximum during first two years, then kind of slows down and approximately after eight years of age, um, it, it plateaus. So during first eight years, um, whatever pathology is developing, that is, um, uh, that can have profound effects in the future. So what are the pulmonary pathologies in EOS? 
we exactly do not know how common is thoracic insufficiency in children with EOS. That is because the definition of TI is variable depending on uh, literature we are reading. However, the common pathophysiological processes are restrictive and obstructive lung diseases. So the restrictive lung disease happens because of reduced chest wall compliance, which can be because of the deformity and possibly reduction in the lung compliance. The child will present with tachypnea with activity. There will be easy fatigability with exertion. Uh, the way to measure it is reduced if we see with normal force expiratory volume 1 and by measuring total lung capacity. But having said that, these uh, pulmonary function tests are not possible in young child and uh, so that, that remains problematic. Also, because of the restrictive lung disease, there is reduced maximum respiratory pressure and uh, the MEP is reduced to a greater degree than the maximum inspiratory pressure. This reduction is further aggravated by underlying neuromuscular disorder, such as spinal muscular atrophy or Duchenne or cerebral palsy, especially GMFCS4 or 5. So this re decreased respiratory compliance leads to increased respiratory work and caloric expenditure. That leads to reduced weight for age and BMI. And all these factors, they contribute to failure to thrive. So this is something this reduced calorie intake and failure to thrive uh, can be treated to some extent and should be taken into consideration while seeing a child with EOS. Also, they have obstructive lung disease. It occurs in approximately one-third of children with EOS. There is central airway narrowing. However, compression of the lower or uh, mainstem bronchus can happen because of intruding spinal elements or mediastinal elements. So this obstruction could be because of the deformity of the spine itself. Lung function is affected and this affection is asymmetrical. Uh, typically, the lung on the concave side of the curve is affected more in majority of the patients. So why, why this is important? So it is important because the interventions on the side with greater function uh, may predispose the child to respiratory failure postoperatively. So especially if thoracotomy is done on the concave side, then the possibility of child needing ventilatory support in postoperative period is high. Also, these children, they have poor respiratory muscle performance. Uh, the force generation involving both inspiration as well as expiration is less. Uh, this leads to rib crowding because of immobility. They develop ankylosis of the costovertebral joint. That leads to reduced intercostal muscle function. And uh, because of this, they are more dependent on diaphragm or inspiratory work. How does it affect the child? Well, um, it causes increased risk of respiratory muscle fatigue and hypercarbic ventilatory failure. There are periods of hypercarbia during sleep and daytime hypercarbia at a later stage. Also, they are known to have sleep-related breathing disorders. They are studied to a lesser extent. Uh, there is prolongation and recurrence of hypopnic events during uh, rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, not necessarily everyone has this obstructive sleep apnea, but that prolongation and recurrence could be the part of a scale which is used to measure obstructive sleep apnea. It is not known whether sleep studies should be done in children and what is the best way to assess sleep-related uh, breathing disorders in these children. It is still evolving. Pulmonary hypertension, although more common in adolescents with severe scoliosis, 10% uh, of children with early onset may have pulmonary hypertension and it will be typically seen in a child with severe spine and thoracic deformity. So in a nutshell, pathophysiology involves reduced lung volumes, uh, reduced chest wall dispensability and excursion, 
and reduced respiratory muscle force and movements. So all this can lead to hypoxemia, poor sleep, increased work of breathing, tachypnea, respiratory failure, and ultimately core pulmonary. So is there a correlation between physiological changes and structural features? Because as orthopedic surgeons, we may think so, but uh, studies have shown that there is no correlation between the pub angle and thoracic dimensions and PFPs. So what, what does it mean that thoracic and spine structures may not be used as a surrogate marker for assessing the lung function Pulmonologist consult is very important for direct measurement of lung function, uh, although can be difficult in Indian settings. All the changes, they happen in children less than five years of age who are too young to perform uh, various pulmonary function tests. So pulmonologist may consider other tests if possible. So knowing this pathophysiology, certain considerations need to be taken into account while evaluating a child. How severely the breathing is impaired at the first visit, the FVC is important. Are there any other pulmonary conditions which are impacting pulmonary function, such as recurrent aspiration syndromes, asthma, lung injury from previous infections? Certainly one thing that needs to be uh, considered is correction of malnutrition be before posting them for any intervention, which, which certainly helps. So in summary, pathophysiology should be taken into account during evaluation and treatment. Consider involving a pediatrician with pulmonology interest or pulmonologist from the beginning and also consider optimization of reversible factors. Thank you. I thank ASCII and POSI and BSI for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ashish, for that very comprehensive coverage. I think you covered all important areas of, uh, especially the cardiopulmonary physiology and pathology in early onset scoliosis. I think we'll have a discussion, a common discussion at the end so that we can discuss all aspects of EOS. I would next invite Dr. Naresh. Dr. Naresh is going to speak to us on investigations, MRI, etc. in early onset scoliosis. So over to you, Naresh. Thank you, sir. Slides up, sir. The slides visible, sir. Very visible, yes. No, no issues. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present uh, uh, the radiological and MRI evaluations. I think the setting has been set. Uh, we all uh, now learned that how important it is to identify the factors. Uh, unlike the adolescent uh, idiopathic scoliosis, the US has got a specific uh, radiological and MRI uh, markers which needs to be clearly assessed uh, for the progression of the disease uh, and to assess the lung volumes and to identify where the pathology is and pick up the patients who are prone for uh, worsening of the uh, deformity. It comes in a huge spectrum. It can be like uh, neurofibromatosis or uh, very young age with formation defects, segmentation defects, syndromic patients. So every patient has got a different uh, spectrum of uh, disease and different presentation in the radiology itself. So radiograph becomes the first and primary uh, investigation where we diagnose these patients and, and this also forms uh, a basis for how you follow these patients. Up. So because it involves a huge spectrum of the disease, it can be a idiopathic uh, scoliosis uh, in a juvenile uh, the infantile scoliosis or it can be congenital scoliosis we need to pick up whether the patient has got any congenital uh, problems of uh, issues with the segmentation or formation defects which have got uh, different levels of progression based on the, the way they present in the radiographs neuromuscular patients behave all uh, all uh, uh, differently and we need to uh, when you see the initial X-ray, the whether it 
this uh, long sea cows which are uh, prone for uh, uh, worsening uh, neurological deficits and also the pelvic obliquity which is very specific feature of this uh, neuromuscular adiponectomy and all the syndromic patients they will have different kinds of uh, combinations uh, in these patients the standard radiographs what we obtain in these patients are the upright tap and lateral uh, scoliosis film series but when it's uh, uh, when you are to deal with the patients who are very less than 2 years it becomes very difficult uh, to get a upright standing um, standing x rays we can have a supine x rays to get knowledge about the pathology but to, to know the progression and the flexibility or a different uh, uh, presentations when the patient is walking we can either have a seated radiograph i think there are uh, radiolucent chairs available you can't take a standing radiograph uh, either because of the age or because of neuromuscular or developmental issues a radiolucent chair with the straps attached uh, uh, is a better option to uh, investigate these patients for the progression unlike as so there are specific measurements in as the what the major uh, measurements are the curve magnitude by cops and we assess the flexibility based on the flexibility and the curve magnitude the treatment protocol will be decided but in eos we need to know the specific features we are more interested in thoracic length the spinal length the thoracic cage dimensions and the lung volumes and the predictors of progression is that this this child is going to worsen and is going to worsen how rapidly the patient is going to worsen in infantile uh, idiopathic scoliosis there are some predictors which have been proposed by nimpin mehta by identifying the rib vertebral angle difference one need to be uh, aware of this rib vertebral angle difference because uh, this forms the way uh, the curve can be progressed because few infantile idiopathic scoliosis patients can spontaneously resolve operating on these patients or uh, subjecting these patients for growth rods uh, is unnecessary and it will be rewarded if you identify these patients who can be spontaneously correctable by uh, correcting with the brace so she has proposed uh, uh, rib vertebral angle difference wherein we identify the angle between the vertebral body and the ribs on the concave and convex side and the difference is the one which she is uh, going to matter uh, the 20 degrees is the correction uh, the factor which has been proposed in addition to the rib vertebral angle difference we can also um, the progression can also be predicted by whether the spine or the rib is in the phase 1 or phase 2 what is uh, really means in phase 1 or phase 2 in phase 1 the convex side rib usually tends to be away from the vertebral body at the apex if you see at the apex if the the rib is overlapping on the vertebral body there is a high tendency for the progression of the disease so this simple terminology or the concept uh, combines the formation of the cage and also the rotation of the uh, apical segment the vertical vertebral body is not rotated and the, the tendency for the rib head to overlap on the vertebral body so there are studies done on the three dimensional effects of this what really means in the phase one about the uh, when there is a phase two there is severe rotation which is uh, happening at the apex so how do you identify this uh, phases we need to look at the apex of the curve and see the how the ribs are being uh, uh, placed in relation to the vertebral body if the ribs are overlapping then you need to identify that this uh, child is going to worsen uh, and we need a close monitoring and aggressive uh, treatment philosophy so the uh, how you basically measure this one is we need to use the placement of a small uh, vertebral end plate line is usually drawn and uh, the rib uh, the longitudinal axis of the rib is drawn on the concave side and convex side and you can use the surgery map software just to measure the angles uh, and how much is the difference of the vertebral band coming to the thoracic uh, development you usually tend to look at the spine and the curvature or how the spine is getting deformed in these patients uh, but it is also equally important how the lung volumes are uh, can be seen on the x ray and uh, this can also be used in the pre operative and post operatively how much the lung capacity is increasing and how much this can change the lung function of the uh, child after uh, uh, you apply a distraction uh, device the space available for the lung are been proposed to actually look at how much of the lung volumes are getting uh, compromised because of the deformity and this can be used as a, a serial prognostic indicator for the uh, development of the lung so how do you measure this uh, space availability for the lung the center point of the 
concave uppermost rib is taken under the diaphragmatic uh, uh, shadow the center point of the diaphragmatic shadow are taken and they are connected both on the concave side and convex side and the volume is expressed as a percentage in here the concave side it's uh, 9 centimeters and the convex side is 13 centimeters and you calculate into the percentage that is a 69 percent is the uh, uh, actually the space available for the lung and this can be used as a measure uh, after uh, correction of the deformity as well so this whenever you are faced with a child who is uh, uh, very young and then you, you are in addition to once you start measuring the cops once you apply a growth rod it becomes mere necessity to actually look into other factors rather than the cob angle because cob angle can be uh, it's fixed because you are already applied a, a growth rod so the thoracic length on the concave side and convex side and you find it, identify the lung volumes and the length of from uh, t1 to t12 which measures the thoracic length, both in the AP view and also in the lateral view. Similarly, the length of the spine, which is usually measured from the uh, T1 superior end plate to S1, T1 to S1 length, both on the AP and lateral radiographs, uh, is the one which is going to give the overall spinal length. And also the width of the thoracic cage can be measured from the uh, AP X-ray and the depth of the uh, thoracic cage can be measured from the lateral X-ray. These are the main parameters which we need to be aware of in addition to the flexibility of the curve and also the uh, curve angle. So flexibility are usually measured uh, uh, by either supine uh, flex side bending views or lateral side bending views and the traction views. It is very important before we apply for the uh, growth rods because once we apply the growth rod uh, in these patients, we can't measure the flexibility any further. So this becomes the important factor when you are uh, trying to do the final fusion. We don't know how much of the curve correction you're going to get. Once you know before the application, the flexibility of the curve that can be compromised. So other most important factor in these uh, patients with uh, other spectrum of uh, disease, which can be uh, picked up on X-rays and which we need to be very careful in following these patients are the congenital uh, EOS patients. Uh, due to formation or segmentation defects. This can happen in uh, different forms, whether you can have a hemivertebra or we can have absence of pedicles on one side and can have a, a block on the one side and it's a combination which is very uh, highly notorious for progression, bar on one side and hemivertebra on the other side. Whether the hemivertebra has got uh, the growth potential left over or not, whether it's fused hemivertebra or incarcerated are the ones which we need to be uh, aware of and also look for them in the X-rays. So you can see there can be a formation defect uh, here, uh, and there can be a intact uh, growth plate on the above and below, and this can be incarcerated on the one side, and it can be free on the other side. And you need to be aware of uh, the bars which happen, and these bars are notorious for uh, progression. When this bar is associated with the unsegmented bar associated with the hemi on the other side, they can uh, rapidly uh, progress. And also the rib, rib formation defects or the absence of ribs and the fusion of the ribs, uh, which, uh, which will have an effect on the lung function of the patients can be picked up on the initial X-rays. So this is a different way of classifying these patients with the, either the hemivertebra is semi-segmented or fully segmented. Fully segmented have a growth potential, double that of the semi-segmented. If it is incarcerated, the chance of growth is a little less compared to the other ones. The block vertebras usually they, de they don't tend to progress because there is growth plates or the curve is not going to tend to progress, but the height of the cage may be affected. But unsegmented bars are the ones which are notorious for uh, progression. So if you see this patient uh, which presented like this, we need to uh, be very careful of what exactly is having uh, the patient is having on the initial X-rays. You see the top two are so the unsegmented bar at uh, T10 and T11 and also T11, T12, this, this have high risk of progression. But there is a fused vertebra at uh, L3-4, uh, which has a uh, very less chance of progression. So these, these things has to be addressed and then identified in the initial X-rays. But it is very easy to uh, look at these patients and identify the defects in the radiographs of the patients who are less than four years. Once the child matures of, um, and ages after four years, becomes a little difficult to identify exactly where is the bar and how is the bar and whether there is a growth plate left over. 
so these cases uh, in these situations when you are planning for surgery it becomes mandatory to get a ct scan to identify uh, the growth potential or an mri to identify the uh, uh, this growth plates left over for the potential growth potential the ct can give you exactly the delineation of how the growth plates are still remaining uh, and what needs to be addressed and where exactly it needs to be addressed when you face with the long sequels like this uh, neuromuscular scoliosis and thoracolumbar deformities the treatment philosophy is altogether changes and we need to be careful in following up these patients and identify the pelvic uh, obliquity which is quite common in these patients uh, uh, which needs to be corrected so coming to the next part of the presentation in addition to the radiographs it's very important to identify what exactly is inside the spinal canal unlike aas patients the eos patients has got high chance of uh, intraspinal anomalies that can range from 18.3% to 47% it becomes uh, mandatory to get an mri before we are operating on these patients and also to need to note the growth potential of the uh, disease Syringoma, syringomyelitis are the commonest, uh, com commonest problems which are usually associated. In addition to that, third rod syndrome is the one which is very important, which we need to pick up. Otherwise, applying a growth rod or correcting these patients and lengthening the spine can be a uh, problem. Uh, there are some cutaneous markers which will uh, give us an idea of what exactly is going to be uh, in the spine. And also, if you face with the patient who is, has got some neurocutaneous markers, and also a congenital defect in the formation of segmentation. It becomes highly mandatory for uh, uh, for getting these uh, MRIs. Then this patient has got a, a tethering, uh, and there is a uh, it's high risk if you don't release these patients and, and subject these patients for the surgical procedures. Split cord malformations, are, malformations are the second most common uh, problems in these patients. It can be two types. Uh, it can be type one, type two. In type one, what you what we usually call as a diastomatomalia. Card is split into two. There is a cartilaginous spectrum on the uh, east side, and type two is the one is split by fibrous septum with wide canal, two, two dural sleeves, also known as a, a diplo, diplo. And, and these patients also present with the deformities of the foot, uh, and we need to be very careful in identifying and, uh, if necessary, releasing them and addressing these uh, deformities before surgical procedure. Neural lactasia is quite common uh, associated with neurofibromatosis, Marfan's hilar danlos, and uh, achondroplasia. Sometimes it can be idiopathic as well. It presents with the widening of the dural sac and associated with uh, NF1, and it outpoaches uh, through the enlarged neuroforamina, erosion of the bone. This becomes a lot of problems uh, uh, causing the erosion of the vertebral bodies and scalloping and, uh, and pedicle erosions and foraminal enlargement, sometimes leading to. Uh, kyphosis. It's important because uh, it erodes the vertebral body and, and leads to very angular kind of deformities uh, uh, involving few segments and vertebral fractures are quite common and neurological deficits are also a problem and it's also important to get a fixation points in these patients when you have a wide nerve canal. It becomes very difficult to put a vertebral pedicle screws you may sometimes need to depend on the sublaminar wires or different uh, philosophies of fixation in these uh, uh, patients. In summary, in addition to curve magnitude and flexibility, we need to look, look at the other factors like thoracic spinal length, uh, thoracic cage dimensions, lung volumes, and predictors of progression in various kind of uh, pathologies. And MRI is mandatory to rule out intraspinal anomalies. And CT will help uh, providing uh, finer details in these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Naresh. I think, again, a very comprehensive coverage of uh, the radiological modalities and MRI and uh, spinal dysrapism in uh, early onset scoliosis. Uh, I would next call upon Sham. Sham is going to speak to us. We are starting with the interventions now, and Sham is going to speak to us on one of the very important in intervention in early onset scoliosis, which is casting. You know. So what are the indications for casting and what are the techniques? Over to you, Sham.
good morning everybody can you all hear me yes can yeah i'd first like to thank all of you for this opportunity i am uh, incredibly honored to be here to talk to you all i have teachers that i respect and have known for a long time and colleagues and friends so what i'm going to talk to you about today is what i've learned from uh, my uh, experiences in casting kids so the data that's there that's presented in this paper or in this presentation is from a prospective study that was published uh, a couple of years ago. I have no disclosures. So the goals of treatment of early onset scoliosis of thor or thoracic insufficiency, I club them both together because they are intricately related, uh, are due to the 3D thoracic deformities. So what would we like to do? We want to increase the thoracic volume to prevent or correct the restriction. We'd like to obtain symmetry of the thorax. We'd like to derotate the spine because there is a fairly uh, significant Im uh, impact of the rotational deformity on the tautness or the tightness of the, of the diaphragm. So you can imagine if T12 and L1 are rotated, they kind of spin the diaphragm and tighten that in decrease the diaphragmatic excursions, hence the importance of derotating the spine. To improve thoracic function and its mechanics, to try and equilibrate the thorax by lengthening the concave constricted hemithorax and improve that abnormal side, and to maintain these improvements during growth. And the purpose of all of this is to try and give the lungs the space available to develop the alveoli. Ashish very beautifully showed how the lungs develop uh, in the growing child. Now, we want to also avoid growth inhibition procedures for these children. Uh, uh, and we want to avoid iatrogenic shortening of the spine and thoracic fusions. So it brings up to the treatment options here. So you have non-operative treatment options and operative options. The non-operative ones being bracing, which is not very effective in this patient population and casting, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. The, the type of casting we use is the EDF or the elongation derotation flexion casting. Operative treatments include non-fusion surgeries that are distraction-based or guided growth-based. The distraction-based ones include the growing rods, which are rib-based, based on where the foundations are, or spine to rib. The guided growth options include the Shilla technique, uh, which is from Little Rock, where Ashish was on faculty for some time, or the vertebral body tethering, or posterior tethers, as the case may indicate. The other operative procedure is a fusion, which we want to try and avoid in the very young children. There are many complications associated with even the growth-friendly and fusion-less approaches. So I am here to propose casting or serial casting as a complementary or alternative method of uh, treatment for scoliosis. Casting was first done by Joseph Rister, uh, Risser, uh, which is the traditional casting, and it uses a three-point bend for correction. It was not until Morel and Cottrell in 64 described EDF casting to address the rotational aspect of the deformity. And this was popularized by Min Mehta, who we all know. Now, like I said earlier, this is all data that was done from work when uh, done in work that was uh, that was done when I was at Riley Children's Hospital, and this was prospectively corrected uh, collected. So we have fifty children aged six months to ten years with early onset scoliosis that were treated with casting. All the casting was done under general endotracheal anesthesia. We had a total of about one hundred and seventy five casts. We measured a lot of things during this uh, study. I measured pulmonary compliance, tidal volumes, airway resistance, peak inspiratory pressures. Now, the, the, the impetus for this is actually uh, because uh, Davale had done a very nice study before that showing that casting increased peak inspiratory pressures during the procedure. I used the uh, Philips uh, module and an airflow sensor, and the measures were obtained, and the measurements were obtained before and after cast removal, before and after spine traction was applied, after cast application, and 
out of traction after the cast windows had been removed. So I measured the amount of traction that I was applying for all of these patients. I had a small uh, inline mar uh, a scale yeah. that was used to measure the amount of traction. And I measured it at the beginning of uh, application, at the beginning of casting, and at the end of casting. A few things that I'd say are really important for those that get started on casting. Endotracheal intubation is important. You have to use a bite block. Otherwise, the traction will have them pinch the endotracheal tube and you will not be able to ventilate your patient. You will place abdominal pads under here and that is important for after the cast is applied because as soon as a patient is off the traction table, that padding will be removed, allowing for room in the belly to allow ventilation. And be aware and expect respiratory changes during this procedure. If your anesthesiologist is not used to this, they may be very alarmed at the numbers that their monitors may show them. This is the frame that I use. Um, it's um, marketed in the United States as a Noel casting frame. Now, based on this, actually, the engineers at Ashish's hospital made a frame for us to use, which we used afterwards. It's just a very simple system of, uh, you know, traction belts and uh, ratcheted uh, levers, which allow you to apply traction to the patient. This is sort of where the position of the patient is. There are two horizontal bars here, one by the pelvis and one under the shoulders. The traction is applied through a head halter. Notice the endotracheal tube in place. The legs are suspended with a sling and the traction on the pelvic side is applied through pelvic slings. These are the pelvic slings that I use. I use a t-shirt which we place on the t-shirt on the patient first. And this is just regular stock in it that's applied. We tie the stock in it, a two inch stock in it around the waist, fairly snug. And then a second knot, a little distal to that, which allows for the attachment of the traction belt. Now here we are transferring the patient onto the traction uh, frame. And that is the patient suspended on the frame. So a halter is there. I've made a little cut in the neck on the mandibular side to allow the mandible to sit there in place. This actually also helps hold this part of the halter in place and prevents it from going back. When I first started, I didn't do this and the halter would sometimes go back and apply an external pressure on the airways and the carotids, which is not a very pleasant thing. I also place a little covering on the head and this comes into use later on when the windows of the cast are cut. You see the slings that are there on the pelvis. The patient is suspended between these two parts and there's the padding to allow room for the belly. You can practice the derotation maneuver before applying the cast. So here, this patient has a right thoracic curve and my left hand is here to pull the chest up on that left side. This is after the cotton is applied. Mm -hmm. And here we go. This is the patient after the cotton has been placed over the stockinette. Here's the pelvic foundation. So I typically apply the cast in stages. I apply a nice foundation around the pelvis and then a nice foundation at the top. And then we complete the middle section of the cast. As the cast is curing, we start doing the derotation maneuver. Remember that the traction is used to elongate the spine. The flexion is the gravity that allows the spine to sag. And then now the derotation maneuver is applied. It's typically three sets of hands. So you have the surgeon or the applier of the cast doing the procedure. You have a second person proximally applying a derotation motion to the chest or the shoulders. And a third person distally kind of applying a derotation to the pelvis to counter the motion that the surgeon is doing. And this illustrates the derotation maneuver. This is what separates this from the, the original RISA type casting where it was just a fulcrum bend. Here we are doing the derotation of the cast. The, the frame has a mirror that allows you to look to see how you are placing your hand for the derotation. 
and that is the cast being completed. I like to put a firm mold over the symphysis. And then I would typically get an in-cast x-ray when I was doing the study to see how much of correction was obtained in the cast. And then we mark out the windows to be taken out. You'll notice that the windows are very large and generous. So in this kid who had a right thoracic curve, we pushed down on the left anterior hemithorax, but I want the right hemithorax to come up. So I have cut the cast off from the meridian on the right side, allowing the entire right hemithorax up to derotate the spine. Similarly, we have large posterior windows and these windows allow the unsupported left side of the chest to rotate out. Here we are completing the petaling of the cast and that's what the finished product on that particular patient looked like. I use simple tape and I often offer the patients the choice what design they want. And I would have these sorts of designs on my patient's casts. It made it a little more acceptable to the young kids. So the key were to cut large windows. I would take out any part of the cast that did not need to be there to exert pressure on the child. The windows gave plenty of room for the chest and the body to rotate out. It gave room for the stomach, so the kid would tolerate their feeds. It gave room for the lungs, and this allowed easy skin care as well. So when uh, Dubusay first saw pictures of my cast, he remarked that these look like French windows, large windows that you could walk out of. So our observations in the study were that pulmonary compliance, tidal volume, airway resistance and peak inspiratory pressures showed improvement as we went through or stabilization. And that the maximal decreases in all of these. So tidal volume and compliance decreased as you applied the cast and airway resistance and PIPs increased. But as you continued following these kids, those changes were not as severe as they were in the first cast. I'm going to show you some illustrations of 100% cast correction, a curve correction now. This is a patient who in three casts went from 43 degrees to 110 degrees. Notice the amount of derotation. The pedicles are symmetric now on this. The chest is symmetric. The space available for the lung is good. The curve is not very large though. It's only 43 degrees. Here is another example of a kid with 45 degree curve with two casts down to under 10 degrees. You can see the shadows of my cast showing the, how much is open for the chest to derotate. Now, kids who had greater than 75% correction, this is an example of a patient who went from 75 degrees to 26 degrees in four casts. Another one that went from 72 degrees to 25 degrees in 10 casts. This kid was a kid who unfortunately came to us fairly late. There were issues with insurance and so on and social situation that didn't allow us to get to her early enough. Curves with less than 75% correction. Here's a kid with 83 degree curve that went down to 29 degrees in six casts. And another one who had 110 degree curve that went down to about 41 degrees after five casts. So what are the indications? So I was to talk on the indications and the actual technique. So after all these years of doing this, my indications are very simple. Any child with a progressive spinal deformity that can tolerate a cast and needs time before surgery can be done is a candidate for casting. But you also need to know what possible behaviors of the curve may be to set the expectations for your parents and yourselves. Thank you very much. I have a few more slides if there is time that I can present, but we can discuss all these things. I have shared the entire presentation with everybody. So feel free to use all of it. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Sham. Again, a very nice presentation. And uh, you've been speaking from your own experience, I think, which is quite vast. You know, you've done so many cases. So that was a very nice talk. and. Uh, Dr. Salil is here now and he is going to be speaking to us on growing rods. Uh, so you've been introduced already.
please go ahead with your topic. Shalini. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to present. Um, you're able to see my slides there. Great. All right, excellent. So I'm going to be speaking about growing rods. Again, uh, I've been asked to speak about when the indications for these procedures and how I do it. These are my disclosures. None are relevant to this talk. I think we've covered these foundational slides very nicely. So the surgical interventions in early onset are ultimately to allow us to increase thoracic height, somehow in influence thoracic volume. So uh, Ashish gave us a great introduction showing that increasing height doesn't necessarily always improve the function of the lungs. So we're there to facilitate lung development and hopefully to alter the natural history. So these children definitely have an increased mortality rate and hopefully we can change that by the interventions that we're taking on. So the indications of when to intervene with surgery, I completely agree with Sham. I think casting should be always option number one, two, and three for these patients. You wanna delay surgery for as long as possible but obviously, by the time you get to needing to do surgery, you want to make sure that there is growth potential. So ideally, I like to wait until the child is at least six before we start with surgical interventions. And then if they get to eight to 10, that's where I start to think about a, a definitive fusion. So that ultimate age for a definitive fusion is, I think, slowly creeping down. And as the longer term studies with growing rods, with magic, as well as with Vepter, have shown that increasing the T1 to T12 height um, doesn't necessarily do any favors for the child if we're increasing the stiffness of the chest wall. And then in terms of curve magnitude and stiffness, again, I try to delay surgery for as long as possible, even if we have a 60, 70 degree curve, if it's flexible with my push prone views or traction views in clinic, I try to talk them into delaying further with either casting or bracing. And so you wanna have documented curve progression despite the non-operative options. So Sham touched on these a little bit. They're you know quote unquote growth friendly strategies. Ultimately, we're just trying to match the expected increase in height of the spine as the child is going through these uh, early growth spurts. So there's growth guidance techniques, compression-based techniques, as well as distraction-based. This talk is primarily going to focus on the distraction-based techniques, but I just wanted to show a few photos of the Shilla technique that Sean mentioned. Here, we're trying to do an apical fusion with uh, extra long rods at the top and bottom of the spine to allow the spine to continue to grow. And then a modification of that shilla is to use active apex compression, so on the convexity of the curve, to compress the spine to get some deformity correction at the apex, but then again, allowing the spine to grow, guiding the spine's growth over time. These compression-based techniques, I honestly wouldn't even mention in a talk for early onset, obviously there's a lot of popularity for the vertebral body tether now in idiopathic scoliosis, mostly for juveniles and very young adolescents. I don't really think that's a great indication, especially for congenital scoliosis or any of the other etiologies for really young children, you know, so five to 10 year olds. You don't want to start getting involved in uh, staples or tether because of the high risk of failure and the need for revision surgeries. So I think the gold standard here is still distraction-based techniques. I'm gonna talk about both traditional growing rods as well as magnetically controlled growing rods. I think Vepter is really uh, designated primarily for thoracic insufficiency syndrome. So if you have some significant congenital rib anomalies, large portions of the chest wall that are fused, that's where I think you can use Vepter to separate the ribs and keep the ribs distracted to allow uh, indirect control of how the spine is deforming. And then there's some newer growing rod alternatives that I just wanted to touch base on. Um, I don't think they're available in the markets, even in the US, uh, but there are some newer strategies to try to get the spine to grow um, as the child is growing. So the traditional growing rods were first performed by Paul Harrington 
in the 70s. I guess you could consider the Harrington rod as a growing rod. It had hooks at the top and bottom with a single distraction rod posteriorly. And then Mo et al. modified his original description, his original techniques in the 80s, uh, allowing for multiple level attachments, again, at the cephalad and caudal extent of the spine. But all of these were single rod techniques. And I think a lot of studies recently have shown higher risks of complications with single rods, including implant failures and crankshaft. Uh, so the dual rod techniques popularized by Ekbarnia in the 2000s has really become the gold standard, at least here in San Diego. I'd love to hear about your experiences at your institutions. So this is how I perform uh, traditional growing rods. Ultimately, you want to choose an upper and lower instrumented vertebra that's in zone one. So it's kind of centered over the center sacral vertical line. Uh, and I'll show some cases when obviously there's significant deformity in the spine or translation of the chest along over the pelvis. Uh, so you have to modify these rules. Ultimately, you want to instrument either two or three levels at the cephalad and caudad extent. Typically, I like to perform that with two separate incisions as shown in the lower image with a subperiosteal dissection only for the anchor points. With larger deformities, with an S-shaped deformity, I tend to open up the entire spine, so using a long incision, uh, but obviously keeping the fascia intact in between the subperiosteal dissections and still passing the implants, the rods underneath the fascia to decrease the risks of wound infection. For my proximal foundation, I typically like this hook claw construct with a cross link, uh, so a downgoing and upgoing laminar hooks, um, and the crosslinks adds additional stability to kind of connect the two rods. Um, pedicle screws are commonly used as well. Obviously, there's the risk of uh, posterior distraction of those screws could potentially damage the spinal cord as they're pulled out. Um, but I'd say if I could get a pedicle screw in comfortably based on the patient's anatomy, I would prefer pedicle screws even in the proximal extent. In the distal foundation, definitely lumbar pedicle screws, and there typically two levels is more than enough. And then you're passing the rods subfascially. Uh, with the traditional growing rods, typically we use these inline connectors and uh, leave them closer to the distal extent of the wound um, to allow for a uh, incisions distally to uh, distract the rods further. And then the goal is to limit exposure because ultimately any part of the spine that you expose is going to get an autofusion, making the final instrumentation and fusion more complicated. So the outcomes of traditional growing rods have been published. Uh, obviously, there's able to control the magnitude of the deformity, maintain spinal growth to nearly matching the growth of the thoracic and the lumbar spine. Everyone is very familiar with the law of diminish diminishing returns. Usually after about six lengthenings, there's significant uh, fusion that's occurred. And even with traditional growing rods, you're less able to distract. And there's overall about a 50% complication rate published. Shea Bess's classic article kind of breaks down the, uh, the number of complications that can occur with traditional growing rods, including implant failures, skin breakdowns, infections requiring multiple revision procedures, as well as anchor failures, both at the proximal and distal extent. Um, my preference is to stick with spine instrumentation. I try to avoid rib instrumentation as much as possible just because of the higher risk of anchor failures that happen uh, with rib fixation. So the magnetic growing rods were introduced in the U.S. in November of 2009. Uh, I was fortunate to be a trainee uh, under Professor Akbarnia when he performed his first surgery at uh, Radies. And then the outcomes were published in uh, 2012 and 2013. So this was the first patient that was performed. I'll show some images from him uh, on the next image. Overall, the magic uh, growing rod Correction rates. The zoom chalchi live. Have been found to be similar to traditional growing rods. Uh, and overall, there's a higher upfront cost, which tends to be balanced by about four to six surgeries 
that don't need to be performed because obviously these lengthenings are performed in job? our clinics. And overall, there's still a high rate of implant failures and unplanned returns to the operating room with both of these uh, techniques, traditional as well as magnetic growing rods. So this was this first patient that was performed. He was an eight plus 11 year old boy with an idiopathic early onset scoliosis, a significant curve of more than 100 degrees. Uh, that had excellent initial correction. That correction was actually maintained. He needed to just have one revision for implant failure and then went on to his final fusion. So with magnetic growing rods, there are some absolute contraindications that everyone should be aware of. So you want to avoid these rods with infectious or pathologic conditions that might weaken the bone. If the patient has any metal allergies or sensitivities, or if they have implanted pacemakers or other electronic devices that would interfere with this external magnet that's applied to their backs in clinic. And also this younger than two years and less than 25 pounds has become more of a relative indication, I think, as uh, people have used these rods in some extreme situations. But despite this newer technology, there's still newer failure rates. So obviously you're familiar with metallosis being a significant concern. There's a lot of debris that's generated with these titanium implants. And most of that debris seems to come from the rods rubbing against each other. And then some of the newer generations of the magnetic rods have had this failure of the actuator pin where the Magic X device was actually taken off of the market for a number of years before now we're finally able to use it again. So just because there's a new technology doesn't mean that it's solving any of the um, issues that we've had with traditional growing rods. And then I'd say these are my indications for still using traditional growing rods in the age of Magic. So this is one of my patients with prader willi significant obesity, Typically, when the thickness of his back goes more than five centimeters, the external magnet has a lot of difficulty activating the magnet within the rod. Uh, if there's a small stature, again, as this patient had, uh, the actuators are only 70 to 90 millimeters in length. And as you can see, ideally, you want those to be just in the thoracolumbar junction. It ended up taking up his entire thoracic spine. If you have significant kyphosis, if they need frequent MRIs, or if their distractions have been maxed out with the power that the magnetic rod can generate, oftentimes you need to go back to traditional growing rods. And then finally, a quick word about these patient reported outcomes. This is a study published by Mike Vitale in 2011. Uh, I think, again, like Ashish mentioned, I think the EOS quality of life questionnaires, as well as the pulmonary function tests, are the most important outcome measures that we should be using in early onset scoliosis. The length of the spine, this artificial, you know, 20 centimeters uh, space available for the lung, all of that doesn't really uh, lead or result in improved outcomes for the patient. Ultimately, you want to make sure that you're treating their psychological burden as well as their pulmonary function. And those are gonna be the ultimate outcomes that matter. So here's a quick case example. Here's an eight-year-old female with syndromic scoliosis. Triradic cartilage is open. She's RISR zero. I've been managing her since she was three. She's had a series of casts uh, with breaks, uh, you know, using uh, bracing in the intervals. I'd love to uh, hear from Sham in terms of his routine for when he alternates between casts and braces. So ultimately, uh, she was getting skin ulcers with her casting, and so it was time to proceed with uh, surgical treatment. As you can see, her UIV and LIV would be in different zip codes. Uh, so I decided to stage her procedure. We did an initial exposure with instrumentation and small rods to get fusions at the uh, UIV and LIV and then applied halo gravity traction to keep her in the hospital for a six week period to slowly increase the uh, amount of weight applied to her spine. So this is the image on the right is where we got her after her period of traction and then uh, magnetic growing rods were applied uh, at about two months from her initial surgery. And here she is uh, three years post-op. You can see the amount of distraction that she's achieved. This has all been accomplished with one surgery. She's 11 now. Her rods have maxed out. 
uh, but I'm just going to continue to observe her until doing a definitive fusion down the road in the next year or two. So a strategy to minimize complications in these challenging populations. So some of these growing rod alternatives that are being explored, there's this one-way self-expanding rod uh, that you can see is pictured here that has a ratcheting device that slowly um, continues to expand. You can see that it's still a dual rod technique, so pretty similar to Harrington's original description, but using the dual rod stabilization to improve outcomes. Again, there's very few case reports published with both of these devices. And then the second one is the spring distraction system. You can see the device on the right side. Again, uh, similar principles, but using a spring to slowly continue to lengthen the spine to drive the spinal growth instead of just allowing the spine to grow and uh, supporting the growth. So some take home points, ultimately you wanna delay surgical intervention for as long as possible. You wanna optimize deformity correction at the index surgery because I think that's about as straight as you're gonna get the patient over time. You wanna understand the limits of the magic technology and know when you still need to use traditional growing rods. And ultimately the most important outcomes in these patients are gonna be their pulmonary function tests and their patient reported outcome measures. Thank you again. Thank you. Me. Thank you, Salil, uh, beautiful coverage. Uh, we move on now. And Ajay is going to speak to us on hemivertebrectomy infusions. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. At the outset, my thanks to ASSI and POSI for the opportunity. I'm going to speak on hemivertebrectomy, why, when, and how. Hemivertebra is a spectrum of disorders. I mean, basically, depending on the location of the hemivertebra, we may get a kyphosis, a scoliosis, or a kyphoscoliosis. For me, one of the most important hemivertebra is a posterior coordinate hemivertebra because it causes kyphosis, which leads to a higher chances of development of a neurological deficit. Therefore, why we should resect a hemivertebra? Because hemivertebra, like a normal vertebra, has got a significant growth potential. The growth potential varies depending upon the type of hemivertebra, but as you can see in this image, a hemivertebra which has gradually progressed to develop a significant uh, kyphoscoliotic deformity. It's also important to resect a hemivertebra because with growth and with time, it leads to an asymmetric effect or loads on the adjacent vertebra, leading to secondary curves, which are initially flexible and later they become structural. As you can see in this child, the, the, the primary curve is relatively very small, whereas the secondary curve, which has become structural, is the one which has caused significant cosmetic deformity to the child. Therefore, it's important for us to identify a hemivertebra much earlier and to do the necessary intervention whenever it uh, is necessary. What are the factors affecting the progression? The type of the anomaly, the site of the anomaly, the number of malformation, as, and as mentioned by Naresh, the associated other anomalies like unsegmented bar or hemis on the same side. We all know the classification of hemivertebra, and we know that the fully segmented hemivertebra is the one which is most likely to pro progress as against a non-segmented hemivertebra, which has got a less chances of progression. The site of anomaly, as shown by uh, Dr. McMaster, we do know that the thoracolumbar or a lumbosacral hemivertebra are more likely to progress and they are more likely to cause cosmetic problem in the form of a neck and shoulder imbalance, higher chances of progression and a pelvic tilt and a truncal imbalance. Therefore, it's important for us to identify the type of hemivertebra and the site of the anomaly and its associated other anomalies which will have a significant impact on the type of progression that particular curve is uh, going to have. One more example of a lumbosacral hemivertebra where there is an oblique takeoff of the lumbar spine. And there is a, initially there could be a compensation, but this leads to usually a significant lumbar rotation and also a pelvic obliquity. And as you can see in this particular example, the deformity tends to become more severe, rigid, and causes significant 
impact on the overall function of the particular patient. Coming to the next question as to when to operate. As we mentioned earlier, it's important to recognize curves which are likely to progress based on the national history, natural history and by understanding the McMaster chart. We, we always prefer nowadays to identify them very early. Once we have identified and uh, looked at the natural history of that particular type of anomaly, a documented progression, it's better to treat them very early so that the chances of the curve becoming significantly more is avoided. We would, if you wait for a longer duration of time, like in this adult child, uh, adult person with a neglected kyphoscoliotic deformity, the amount of the magnitude of the surgery which we need to do becomes significantly more with more complications and higher risk. It's not necessary to wait for a longer duration of time to document progression. The moment we realize that the curve is progressing with serial radiographs, it's important to intervene at that particular time rather than wait for the curve to become much more significantly bigger or structural. The advantage of this is that we can do a relatively simple surgery and it is a short segment fixation which gives a overall good results rather than wait when the as when the secondary curves become structural and we need to new, need to do a, a prolonged or a long duration of surgery. When to operate, the goal is to have a straight spine with normal physiological profile and a short fusion. Therefore, we should operate before the adjacent vertebra developed a symmetrical shape or before the secondary curves become structural. Therefore, what is the ideal age? It usually in a solitary hemivertebra the ideal age is between two to five years so that we wait for adequate development of the bone, better ossification, but the curve is still flexible and there's adequate soft tissue to cover the implant which we are going to introduce when you are doing the deformity correction. As I mentioned earlier, a delayed surgery usually includes a secondary vertebra and the compensatory curve. How we need to plan the excision. As Dr. Naresh has sh showed, we have to go through the radiographs to identify the type of anomaly, the level of anomaly, what is the sagittal and coronal alignment, the associated abnormality that has to be looked at. CT gives us a better idea about the position of the vertebra associated lamina. Sometimes the lamina could be deficient, and but most of the time there is a uh, half development of the lamina. If there is a deficiency, then we should be more careful while we are doing the exposure. The status or the shape or the size of the pedicles and the associated abnormalities. We all know that congenital anomalies are associated with neuraxial abnormalities. Therefore, it's always important to get an MRI done before we proceed on to do the surgical intervention. Coming to how to operate, the factors to be considered is the length of the incision, I mean, as mentioned earlier, immature spine fuses with the exposure. Therefore, it's important to limit our incision to the levels planned for the fusion. Dissection is also important. Pre prevent the PJK by preserving the midline structures whenever it is possible. Try not to damage the capsule at the upper extent so that to prevent the chances of PJK. Pedicle screw fixation. It usually is the main state when you do a hemivertebra excision. It should be preferably an image guided. Relatively, because the bones are relatively weak, the, the biggest diameter screws, the longest diameter screws should be the one which we should try to introduce. If it's necessary, if the quality of the bone is not good, it may be better to reinforce the fixation by using hooks or an additional hook rod construct as shown in the figure on the right. In thoracic, it's relatively easier to excise the rib head and the nerve roots, whereas in the lumbar, it's always important that the nerve roots should be identified and spared. The careful exposure of the hemivertebra and the posterior elements is important. Periosteum to be preserved outside the area of the fusion. We should always remember that most of the hemivertebra, especially in the thoracic or the thoracolumbar area, are situated on the posterior side, and they're more likely to call kyphosis. Whereas the lumbar hemivertebras and the lumbosacral hemivertebras are usually in line with the coronal plane. Therefore, your dissection tends to be more into the lordotic segment or more anteriorly. 
whereas the thoracolumbar hemivertebra is easier to approach. The spinous process, lamina, and the facet joints are removed. There are four biological principles as put by Bologna et al. The option one is just to resect the hemivertebra, wherein you retain the surrounding growing structures and use compressive flow forces to close the gap. And there is a spontaneous uh, filling up with new bone formation. Whereas option two, along with the hemivertebra, you remove the part of the uh, growing structures. Whereas option three is what I personally usually do most of the time is excising the hemivertebra and the surrounding growing structures along with the adjacent part of the disc. And this gap, usually we apply a compression force. If the gap is bigger, then you can fill it with bone graft or a cage. And this is what I usually do apply. And very rarely you have to do option four, that is complete excision, something like a vertebrectomy, which is probably necessary when you delay the uh, procedure when the child is relatively older, where you need to excise it like a total vertebrectomy. Therefore, how to operate? The transverse process and the rib head needs to be resected in the thoracic spine. The pedicle excise as needed. The anterior and lateral aspect of the hemivertebra are excised. As I mentioned in the thoraco thoraco lumbar area, the hemivertebra is the one which we usually approach first at the apex when you do your dissection. You first identify it, identify the lateral aspect, remove the transverse process and in the rib in the thoracic spine, get to the lateral margin along the lateral aspect of the body, further as much anteriorly as possible. Then you excise the lamina so that you identify the whole of the pedicle. And this involves when you totally denude the pedicle outside and then you can excise the disc leading on to complete resection of the hemivertebra. The compression is applied on the convex side until the gap closes. You should always remember to look at the CT scan. If there is a concave bar on the opposite side, it needs to be osteotomized. These are some examples of hemivertebra where there's no structural changes in the adjacent vertebra, wherein it was excised and stabilized. Sometimes when the quality of the bone is relatively poor, your purchase of your screw is less, it can be augmented by using hooks constrict and the supralaminar and the infralaminar hook, which can also be used to close the gap so that the stress on the uh, pedicle screw bone interface is relatively lesser. This is an example of a child with a trekker collin syndrome at a seven-year follow, reasonably well-maintained correction. What about using an unilateral approach? But my preference is always a bilateral approach because to close the, once you excise the hemivertebra, and if you want to close it, you need to mobilize the disc space on the opposite side. And for me, that's why I always prefer to do this type of approach. What I usually do is to go on the, I put the screws and then go on the concave side, excise the facet, mobilize the disc space, and then once I have done that, put a temporary rod on the concave side, then move on to the lateral on the convex side, do the hemivertebra excision. And that allows you to compress so that your primary aim is at the end of your excision, the end plates are parallel to each other. And that is really important. As you can see in this example, the end plates are not that much parallel. And I'll show you later why being Trying to get a good parallel end plate is important so that it prevents the adding on so that the deformity is corrected and the chances of adding on which happens later on becomes significantly less. These are few ca case examples. I show you a case example of an interesting a posterior hemivertebra. Hemivertebra wherein uh, it was a relatively older child about 10 to 12 years of age. We did just did the posterior instrumented deformity correction and fusion. And over a period of time, as you can see, over a period of four years, how the anterior part of the vertebra has grown. The basic problem in these type of scenario is because the facet is subluxating, it is prevent, it is causing a pressure over the anterior part of the vertebral body, preventing further growth. Therefore, once you correct the deformity, stabilize it and fuse it posteriorly, the anterior part of the vertebral body starts to grow again. I would like to just show a short video of a three-year-old child with a deformity of the back which has been
progressively not uh, progressed over a period of two years. In spite of serial casts and braces, the deformity tend to progress to about 86 degrees. The child had two hemivertebras, a T12 and L2 hemivertebra. Uh, therefore, since the deformity was progressive with failure of the casting method, but still it was flexible, it was planned for excision of both the hemivertebras. As I mentioned earlier, my first stop is always to put the screws and then mobilize the disc space on the concave side. Then only go to the opposite side to identify, unucleate, remove the lamina so that you identify the pedicle. This is in this case, this is the pedicle of the T12 vertebra. You identify the pedicle, you remove the lamina and totally deskeletonize it so that you can protect the nerve root before we uh, start doing the excision of the hemivertebra. As you can see, this is a just a laminectomy. You can do a laminectomy using keresons, nibblers, or even nowadays by using a ultrasonic bone cutter. The advantage, as I mentioned, most of them are situated on the dorsal side. Therefore, they are much, the dura is, moving, is away from the uh, excised part of the hemivertebra. This is using an ultrasonic cutter to do perform the remaining part of the laminectomy. And once you have removed the facet, removed the lamina, next step is to mobilize or do the discectomy above and below the hemivertebra. And once you have released the disc above and below, it's usually quite easier for you to totally enucleate the whole of the hemivertebra. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a magnified view under the microscope. This is the whole of the hemivertebra is now mobilized and excised. It's important to remember that it's always important that you have excised the end plate of the vertebra above and the vertebra below, the cartilages end plate, so that you'll be able to close the defect and also achieve good fusion. In this patient, since there was two hemivertebra, we went on to excise both the hemivertebras. A rod is placed then on the convex side. The other rod is still intact but is released and the deformity is corrected. Depending upon whether it is a significant kyphosis, we prefer, prefer to place a cage inside. If not, pack it with a lot of bone grafts, compress it to achieve a good uh, correction. It's important to follow up these children on a long-term basis. As, you can, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to get two parallel uh, end plates. And as you can see, compared to the first year and fourth year, at the end of eight year follow up, you can see there is an adding on. There is some degree of kyphosis. The child is now the is about 20 years, is now 20 years of age, but the deformity is acceptable. But a long term follow up is very, very essential in these uh, pediatric or early onset scoliosis children. To conclude, hemivertebra excision to be considered when there is evidence of progression. The ideal age is between two to five years or before the adjacent vertebra develops structural changes. Aim is to have the shortest segment fusion with parallel end plates. Sometimes it means that you may have to include four vertebras or usually whenever it's very earlier, the quality of the bone is a, a better, it may be a very short segment. I would always prefer to mobilize and excise the disc on the concave side to achieve easy correction and reduce the stress of the implants before I go on to the convex side. And it's always important to have regular follow up even after skeletal maturity or up to skeletal maturity is definitely very often, but even after skeletal maturity to know whether there is an adding on or the deformity is progressive. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ajay. This is very beautifully explained and illustrated in your lecture. Your lecture was an excellent one. Uh, we are running short of time, you know, and we are two speakers now. Uh, I would request Abhay to talk on complications, you know, complications in management of US. 
and uh, that would be followed by bhavuk's uh, lecture so the surgery thank you dr johari uh, the surgery for early onset scoliosis is, is as perfect as the perfect man drawn by leonardo da vinci it's full of problems and the problems only get bigger to the extent that today i would call problems as a natural history i think all of you would agree that uh, scoliosis early onset scoliosis in my i mean i heard salil saying 50% complication rates i'm going to quote my patient a 200% complication rate which means that every every patient of mine is going to have two outings that are slightly off from what i had planned uh, you know initially and this is probably the only surgery that has survived such a high complication rate so the problem for the ear surgeon is that um, the surgery is riddled with a bad pitch to begin with uh, there's a variable cr uh, clinical uh, presentation the whole bunch of people are getting grouped into the same pathology and uh, there's an, the unpredictability of growth and of course your patient is a really tiny emaciated kid especially in the this part of the subcontinent uh, kids have very poor skin cover they are malnourished and they turn out you know just like skin and bones and they are the size of your palm literally they're significantly deformed because most of them come in pretty late and of course they um, invariably have multi organ involvement so the the key question is to minimize your complication you want to operate late but then how early can you operate right so if you operate early you're tempted because the curve is supple you can get some good correction and you can uh, often uh, work on lesser levels and the more you wait uh, for the child to develop Uh, and get stronger to take up this uh, you know big endeavor um, the soft tissue covers uh, gets better and then the you know bony points get better so there are pros and cons of you know operating early and operating late but the dictum here uh, would clearly be uh, you know there is a weight cut off of about 12 or 14 kilos depending on the institute that you work but to minimize your complication as a general anesthesia risk and as a you know general patient risk you want to delay surgery as much as possible and i think that's the rule that will come out from all surgeons who operate for um, uh, you know for early onset scoliosis and that's where the role of casting comes in and all of us should be able to do castings you know in a in a in a you know pretty professional manner and it's a it's a it's an art that has been reinvented and that's now you know got again in the mainstream and everyone in every meeting is talking about castings now the problem with surgery is that it's mostly done posteriorly and posterior surgery as you can imagine in this uh, you know this uh, group of patients will have all these intuitive problems skin breakdown because there's literally no skin and this, you know your screw heads are going to be popping out uh, progressive rotational deformity because growth rod eventually is just a distraction device um, uh, auto fusion because these uh, you touch a kid's spine and he starts to fuse um implant loading problems because these are small implants and of course the sagittal plane uh, deformity so let's take a few of them at a time and i'm going to try and show you my cases and some of the solutions that i have worked around so the first problem was skin complications related to the implant profile which again is intuitive there's no reason to not understand why you get skin complications even in the best of scenarios you have these bulky implants popping out and uh, the tinier the kid that you operate the more this implant profile and you really worry when your when a child who the parent is very happy about because the child is straightened up after the eos uh, implant uh, looks like that but sometimes it can start uh, getting very tricky and especially at the top end you can have you know uh, a rod popping out these are all my cases and then sometimes it can get plain ugly and uh, this can be a disaster uh, of course uh, parents often underplay it but you know that this child is heading for a big problem like this girl needed finally implant exit a flap and you know really badly scarred looking spine you would hate to show this patient as yours in any meeting uh, the other strategy that you would use to minimize um, the you know the uh, prominence of the implant is do a single growth rod in the concavity because concavity dips in and especially the child is small uh, even though we all believe in double growth rods i think a single growth rod can be a bail out until the child grows up and then you add another growth rod uh, to this there is a role of um, anterior surgery and uh, there was a question on the chat box about uh, this so this is something that my mentor dr bhojraj has been practicing if it's a very young kid with a, especially a lumbar uh, hemivertebra which is kyphosing so you don't want to wait for too long this sort of an anterior surgery can be done at a very early age and um, literally low profile implants can be used to this is actually a tension band wire uh, anterior enucleation and this uh, surgery can you know hold the test of time but remember this is only possible when there's a localized apex so you cannot try an anterior tether in a regular round back uh, eos and uh, for example this child also our case done you know in the uh, uh, early 2000s 
uh, anterior and anterior teeth there was tried, but see what happens as she grows up. They get a posterior crankshaft phenomenon. They start kyphosing, and this gets very very difficult to treat after you know after she presents to you with a deformity at, at adolescence. The other strategy, of course, is I think all of you would use it is in tiny kids. You can use cervical lateral mass screws because they're low, lowest I mean lowest profile. Of course, these uh, are, are again good. If there's an apical fusion in your uh, gamete and if it's a growing rod, sometimes these screws, uh, you know, will not uh, will not be good. I have used the Lukey trolley because uh, a lot was written and it is indeed a flat implant. It has the least profile, but it comes. So this is a child who was a non walker who had multiple surgeries for um, meningomyelocele. And, uh, you know, uh, but as you see, as the Lukey trolley starts to expand, uh, uh, it starts to unlock from the wires and it starts the child starts to kyphose. And this child eventually landed up like this and needed a, a primary or a final fusion at an early age. We're still following her up, but she's all right. Another uh, strategy again, again was mentioned was to try and get some implant on, I mean, some um, push down on the apex because the place where the skin gives way is really the apex of the convexity of the convexity. And you can see the screw sits out. So if you can control the apex, you can also help uh, prevent uh, the progression of rotational deformity. So the surgery that I normally like to do for a conventional growth, uh, you know, growth rod is a surgery which starts with a convex rod, which has an apical anchor, and uh, you put a cantilever down on that rod, and uh, uh, then put your, um, you know, put your um, uh, growth rod on the concave side. So you have tight screws at the apex, loose screws at the ends, which tends to grow. Of course, you have to lead, uh, leave the rod, rod long, and that can be a problem because it can stick out from the skin. And then you do serial distraction on the concave side, so it's like a, you know, like a double barrel growth rod. Uh, technique it will also help uh, correct deformity uh, progression and of course um, uh, as um, you know sometimes this is what I do I like a single long incision because I know that's the incision that's going to be a you know user friendly incision for long and um, uh, in the, through this I do uh, some muscular implants so I try not to do periosteal dissection and uh, you know you do transmuscular implants to try and minimize the problem of autofusion and um, this is uh, this seems to have worked in my hands. Like this is the last surgery we did uh, like two months ago in Burundi, in the middle of Africa. Even there we could get this uh, kind of. A, so you see the two screws at the apex. So you always start with the easier rod in this child because the deformity was very severe. We started with the concave rod. We got it right. We could get the alignment right. Then we hazarded ourselves and uh, got the convex rod. Where again we did the you know top and bottom screws and then finally got the apical screws in. Uh, intraoperatively, of course, you can have difficulties when the presentation is quite hideous. You can have a problem with finding out, uh, you know, where to put your screw. But I think most of you guys are experts at this. Uh, when I'm unable to do so, I uh, resort to wires or to hooks or even claws. And sometimes rib ileum constructs. And this is again early, you know, 2008, I think you can see on the, it's a rib ileum construct. They don't last too long, but they're good, good for a bailout. This guy had a scarred. Uh, you know, apex, which which had been operated before. So there was, um, uh, it, I was quite, uh, you know, quite perplexed to, to put in implants in this guy. So this seemed like a good extra spinal um, uh, uh, gizmo. Uh, we developed one with one of the local uh, industry, uh, industry partners, but it's not really done so well because obviously this is a one-sided implant. It's, it's at a flat profile. And uh, I think the indications to use these kind of, we call it the desi vector are uh, uh, very, very minimum. So uh, going from then, I've really not used this that commonly. Uh, and then the EOS complications of natural history, which means almost all your patients will go through this at some point or the other. Screw pull out or, or implant breakage, um, and, and, or screw pull out or, um, you know, rod pull out, rod backing out at the top or at the bottom is again, uh, one of the common complications. As you can imagine, the screw has very little hold and there's a constant pull out strength on that uh, or pull out force on that screw, especially at the top. So both these um, are very, very commonplace. And I, I mean, I counsel my uh, the parents that every third or fourth outing, you may need to, you know, uh, aside of the rod distraction, you may need to reset these, uh, you know, these. And uh, one of the ways to deal with it, as everybody knows now, is to avoid a pure flat distraction, but to try and contour the rod in a way that uh, the distraction area, the thoracolumbar junction is nice and flat, so it can distract. But at the top and the bottom, you try and contour the rods. So the, the, there is less pullout strength, uh, uh, less pullout force there. And I think this is what uh, is the take home uh, message from um, as far as this is concerned. Or else sometimes, you know, if you are really worried, 
you can do a staged operation get your anchors in let them fuse put some bone graft around it and come back after 3 or 4 months and then put in your growth rod uh, implant breakage these kids are monkeys you know they are just they just will not listen to uh, anyone and uh, they are going to jump around and your implants are compromised they are thin rods so again implant breakage in my hands is almost a rule and uh, the good news is that uh, you know after 3 or 4 outings or 5 outings the child is also bigger and you are able to put in bigger rods and uh, sometimes you can brace them if they are you know if they are fine the wound giveaways can be a, a disastrous complication like this child which who i showed earlier eventually has ended up with a short trunk because she's still very very young but there's we have to take off implants treat her infection uh, wait you know give these bad scars and finally uh, you know give her a few, badly few spine if you may so it can be a real real problem and finally problems with planning the strategy uh, so this kid came with what looked like a progressive uh, uh, curve which um, from age 1 to 2 again here i was not so good at casting but back then i was not so sure of casting and i was a bit bold about uh, growing rods so uh, we went ahead and did the growth rod at an early age uh, which was still okay but uh, the signal that ca kept coming was that the chi the uh, uh, rod kept backing out either the screws backed out or the rod backed out and what i had missed was an apical um, hemi vertebra that was posterior and i had not uh, done an adequate imaging pre operatively and uh, hence the child kept kyphosing and that was the force that kept pulling back and um, we found that out much later and uh, we did a we did a late uh, osteotomy and we tried to you know harness the apex so this is all like trying to clean up the mess that you have created and uh, because of so many outings the child eventually had an infection we tried to salvage and eventually he's um, you know arjun bailed me out with his uh, fantastic cast and the child is now on a cast so this is gone in the reverse order because uh, honestly of a surgeon error in uh, in um, you know in planning the strategy so today if a child with a significant kyphosis uh, comes in i cut my losses and i offer them a uh, primary fusion uh, here is another interesting case who uh, had who presented with the l5 hemi vertebra and again it was a tiny kid decompensating so we went ahead and did a hemi vertebra excision and a very uh, short kind of a fusion with a wire and he did well on that front but he started developing his eos Uh, after that on top and then we had to add a growth rod so uh, as you can see um, the this surgery is riddled with problems and these problems are uh, you know they they uh, make you humble actually as you, as you see more and more of these surgeries you realize that you know uh, you can only do that much the message out there is stay strong because this is going to keep coming at you and you got to keep rising to the occasion and um, uh, you will learn as you grow as i have over you know over so many years and we learn from the experience of the masters um thank you dr johari and thank you arjun for having us uh, you know having us present here thank you abhay for being the problematic surgeon i think uh, excellent that you showed uh, you know it's not a field uh, like a walk through field you know you really need expertise to be able to handle early onset scoliosis and uh, now invite uh, bhavuk uh, bhavuk is going to speak to us on syndromic scoliosis early onset and special consideration uh thank you jory sir uh, and i thank uh, asi and posi for giving me this opportunity uh am i visible and audible yes yeah well, so uh, i will be covering the syndromic uh, scoliosis and you know if we look at the definition of syndrome you know the it's a basically a, a, a fixed you know there are some fixed uh, signs and symptoms and the pathologies which are occurring you know more than one times and the people have recognized that this is a you know this can be linked to a a single uh, pathogen uh, you know the the pathogenic basis then they call it a syndrome and when we talk about the spine surgery you know we have some usual suspects when we uh, look at the scoliosis like these are the cases you know these are the uh, syndromes which we know uh, they present very commonly like neurofibromatosis marfan's ossa imperfecta elden loss predervilli uh, familial dysautonomia or the rille syndrome so these are fairly common but sometimes we and these you know we can recognize with their you know the classical phenotype uh, the marfan's and the neurofibromatosis but then there are some you know the uh, the, the syndromes which catches scoliosis you know uh, not as a usual uh, uh, usual finding but as a 
this thing but they become important because they carry you know the some important surgical and the the considerations like the coagulation abnormalities abnormal bone mineral density so we again we have to be aware and we have to be you know very cautious and the another thing is that you need a good genetic backup uh, and the good genetic services at your institute and um, uh, this is a must if you are treating these syndromic scoliosis because only then you can identify the basic pathology and then you can label these syndromes and then you can understand the basic pathophysiology behind these disorders so this is this slide is true for every scoliosis that you have to understand the disease then you have to plan your management and accordingly you perform your plan to avoid the complications and then you uh, you assess the outcomes so the general issues in syndromic scoliosis are you know they are multifold they can be related to cardiac urogenital abnormalities the neurological uh, you know the symptom they have more higher incidence of you know the neuroaxial abnormalities nutritional problems they are fairly common and they frequently require a coordination with your pediatric uh, you know the, the nutritional expert and even the pediatric surgeons to put a gastrostomy tube um, you know before uh, to build up their nutri nutritional backup ligamentous laxity becomes challenging you know because they progress very rapidly and the 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 uh, your the the area of fusion and the the area adjacent to your area of fusion becomes a problem uh, fairly commonly in these uh, syndromic uh, patients coagulation abnormalities they are again very common the ocular problems they are they are especially in like in marfan syndrome they are fairly common and i always get a uh, you know the visual field uh, documentation uh, before the surgeries because you know uh, this can become a medical legal issue if the, the patients develop some vis visual problems which are fairly common with any scoliosis prob uh, you know the surgery uh, it is well reported so you know then you have something to back up that you know there was a pre-existing problem and what is the, the the new thing which has occurred after the surgery dental abnormalities again become very important like an osteoid imperfecta putting tubes when the discussion with anesthetist becomes important wound healing is often a concern and then there are other orthopedic issues like the uh, the developmental dysplasia of hip and the shortening of the limb that also affects your surgical planning so one has to be very careful and this requires a multidisciplinary support and the preparing for surgery of these patients it requires a multidisciplinary care i'm not going to detail i will be just covering the the, the surgical uh, the, the points related to the syndromic scoliosis as a as a spine surgeon you know what we face the casting and bracing it requires very judicious use and they are a great friend uh, when you are dealing with the syndromic patients to delay the surgery as Dr. Salil pointed out that we need to delay these uh, the surgeries at least you know if we can delay it by 60 years at least then we can get, get good outcome with the help of the growth rods or the, the other, other modalities of surgical treatment. The casting and bracing remains an issue because like in osseous imperfecta if you do this casting then the rib deformation uh, it, it also is a, is, a, is a problem and then there is a thing called valley effect that means the the ribs they, they ballooned out posteriorly and your 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 spine goes into lordosis so it becomes a very challenging to put screws uh, you know in these cases so this has to be kept in mind and they need to be followed up very carefully Halograft retraction is again a, a good friend uh, in certain cases like in neurofibromatosis, sharp angular kyphosis and like in this and uh, my indications remains that if these patients they come to me with as a respiratory compromise and if there is a pre-op neurological compromise you have to study their CT scans very carefully and if you see an, any 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 rip penetration to the canal then this is uh, this is a contraindication and one has to be very careful and one should be aware uh, of this problem in, in neurofibromatosis. Like in this case you can see here a very severe uh, scoliosis with neurofibromatosis Fibromatosis and this we have we we Dr. Abe pointed out that in sharp such kyphosis we had to go for primary fusion. Uh, so uh, so I also went for the primary fusion and you know uh, these patients they once you fix them once you give them the uh, a good spine to you know as a foundation then they recover nutritionally as well as in the respiratory they are everything improved and you can see the 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 the, the gross difference in the in the the body built uh, after the surgery you know uh, within two years. Now, one when we are dealing with these uh, syndromic patients, we should be aware of the abnormal anatomy. Now, as a spine surgeons, when we think of the abnormal anatomy, our mind usually goes towards the towards the bony anatomy itself. But the the soft tissue anatomy is very is very very important. I like would like to show you a case of Ehlers Danlos syndrome. You know, when uh, these uh, these have very large vessels, and the anterior surgery is frequently contraindicated in these cases. Like in this case, you can see even from the posterior side, there was a uh, the arch of aorta, you know, it was very, uh, very near to the uh, to the transverse processes, and you can see here that it, you know, if you are not careful, then while dissecting itself, you know, you can you can injure the aorta. So one has to be very careful, and you have to look every subtle signs, you know, even when the exposure becomes a challenging problem in these in these cases. 
Now, the bony anatomy itself, you know, especially in dystrophic varieties of neurofibromatosis, like in this case, it becomes quite challenging. And if you look at the CT scan, the uh, the besides the uh, the dural ectasia, the abnormal pedicles, you can see that the whole of the vertebra is extruded out uh, from from the from the normal canal. canal. So these sort of, sort of cases they require special planning. There is no doubt that this requires the the excision of this vertebra. But doing it from the posterior approach alone is not possible because of the lumbar spine and it's the the nerve root. So this requires combined, you know, the anterior and posterior VCR. So these cases, again, they become challenging and they require, you know, the uh, uh, flexibility in your approach and your flexibility in your surgical techniques so, so that, you know, you can deal. This is, a, you can see here, the classical uh, dural ectasia producing the, the uh, almost non-negotiable uh, pedicles and they require the special. So we did it from the front first, from the front approach. We approached it. There was an ilolumbar vein. Uh, we had to ligate it. Then we took it out, took it out vertebra. Uh, then we went uh, posteriorly. We uh, corrected the deformity, corrected the, the, the completed the VC. But again, there was a challenge to to uh, you know uh, restore the uh, the coronal balance because the whole of the spine was shifted to one side. Then we had to use this kickstand screw technique as popularized by Lenke, and then we could get a, a decent outcome in um, in the coronal and the sagittal balance. And this is the post-operative pictures. Now these cases, they they some of these cases like Marfan, Ellard, and Loss, they have you know the flexibility, and this flexibility may not be friendly always because it becomes quite challenging to push mm -hmm. put your screw. So this is a like a technique which I use. I use the 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 uh, screw in the adjacent segment. I kept keep the uh, the handle intact, and then you can use it as a as a you know the uh, stabilizing agent, and then you can use yeah. this uh, uh, you know uh, you can put the screws or you can make track in the in the adjacent segments, and that's how we 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 proceed. Uh, this thing so this becomes quite challenging flexibility may not be friendly always and this is a useful technique especially in in syndromic uh, cases mm -hmm. and this is the uh, you can the same case you can see here the good correction which you can get in this case uh, the fluoroscopic guided navigations the oam guided navigation is 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 a very useful tool especially in these uh, syndromic cases like in neurofibromatosis and the robotic assisted particle screw placement is also you know you have to be very um, um, you know the, you you should be knowing what you are uh, doing and how to use the robot perfectly uh, especially when the when the um, when the things they are moving into the cervical spine the deformity is moving to cervical spine the robot i find more useful than the the oam in uh, in syndromic cases when there is flexibility too much then the robot itself actually tell you that the navigation is actually going to the right direction or not uh, 3D printed models they also helps you in um, in you know in understanding and you can keep these 3D printed models uh, on the table and you can look at the actual anatomy um, uh, at the time of surgeries the 3D printed drill guides again they are quite useful when we have published it now the pedicle screws uh, they are although the the main horse uh, main, main workhorse but they they may not be uh, feasible always as Dr uh, Abhay also pointed out and then these these dumbbell sort of you know these uh, uh, protrusion into the uh, into the neural foramina they also tells us that the, there is no way that you can put pedicular screw uh, either you know the uh, neither the um, the extra pedicular or, or the intra pedicular uh, the inside the pedicle so these becomes very challenging and you have to think of you know the the other alternatives like uh, uh, sublaminar wires and the hooks you can see here we have used uh, in this neurofibromatosis case again another case and the hooks they are again very friendly and if you use properly with judicious releases they can give you a very good outcome like in this case the another case of using just the hooks you can see that i have used the hooks in various uh you know the uh, the uh, the, uh, the in the in the various forms you know uh, to to making a claw and the and and, the, and we are using it for the maximum advantage so that we can get the the, the good correction now the other thing is like nowadays we have uh, we are using a lot of laminar screws. The in fact the thoracic laminar screws and we have found it very useful. And you can see here this case like this is a scoliosis case uh, and uh, the the pedicles the concave pedicles they were not uh, perfect to put the screws. So we use these laminar screws uh, on at the apex. And then we apply this rod. We use two dominoes, and then we uh, use these, uh, you know, the uh, the reducers, uh, and then it derotates as well as it reduces. And this is the the correction you can see here, and this is the X-rays uh, pre and the post op just using the laminar screw. So again, these laminar screws, and we actually got the grant from from the government for developing uh, these laminar screw systems. 
uh, cervical these uh, syndromic scoliosis they also have you know the uh, the frequent uh, you know the um, uh, their extension into the cervical spine as well and if you are correcting a deformity then you need to uh, uh, know how to put these pedicular uh, cervical pedicular screws and the uh, uh, pediatric uh, age group cervical uh, pedicular screws again they are quite safe and we have published this paper and uh, uh, they are quite safe now this is an example of a syndromic case you can see here that the uh, there is a t1 tilt and the, the deformity is quite into the cervical spine and uh, the putting pedicular screws again it becomes quite challenging even with the navigation uh, because the the trajectory of the of the screws they are quite outside and then you have to think of some innovative techniques that how to deal uh, with these cases and you, these syndromes you know if you look at the clinically then you can see that something is off and then you should always be picking up these uh, syndromic cases uh, so in this we uh, we we use a combination of the pedicular screws and the laminar screws to derotate the spine proximally and we could get a good outcome you can see here uh, in this in, in this child another case of very syndromic uh, scoliosis you have to be thinking you know you have to be examining each and every part and this is a case you know which progressed very rapidly uh, uh, within two years and then when we looked in, into the into into the CT scans you can see here that the there is a almost 180 degree rotation just at the within two vertebra so from d4 it is rotated in this direction and d6 is rotated in, in this direction so this becomes you know the quite challenging that how to derotate such close this thing so uh, and this is the 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 the, the post op you can see here that I have connected the uh, the screws which are rotated into the same direction and then we we use them the different rods and then we derotated them in the same direction so again these require special planning and this is the uh, the post operative correction uh, you can see this technique now these uh, these cases they are often neglected and they present with very severe deformity especially these neurofibromatosis cases and to getting these cases uh, is, is they require the vertebral column resection and there is no point of using the growth uh, friendly techniques in these cases you have to go for primary surgery in these cases this came to us with spastic paraplegia uh, and this becomes quite challenging and these require some modification of the the, uh, the traditional VCR so we published this technique called modified posterior vertebral column resection and in this week we retain the uh, the posterior elements till the end so that the cord remains quite uh, you know the healthy because it is hanging from the from the epidural veins from the posterior elements and you complete the vcr uh, first so this is quite healthy and this has you know have not uh, we have not seen any a single case of neurological deterioration till now uh, in in our our uh, series so this was a case and this we could get so again you have to see that you know you have to so in this case you have to your armamentarium of your instruments and the implants they should be uh, you know everything should be available 3.5 millimeter system 4.5 millimeter systems cobalt chrome rods the tapered rods so everything we have used in this implant various types of dominoes which are connecting 3.5 to 4.5 mm system 4.5 mm to 5.5 mm system so everything should be on the table because um, my aim remains to use the maximum diameter rod possible in in, the, in these cases don't shy from staging we have seen the uh, these the, the previous speakers also the uh, so if you if you're doubtful about the uh, bone density uh, and during the surgery it is always useful to use the staging uh, you know let them let the anchors fuse first and then after 3 months or maybe 6 months then you go ahead and then you apply these these growth rods now this is a technique uh, this is a, an implant which we have devised we have called it as a rip screw and we uh, will we uh, so just a single exposure you know the single level exposure gives you actually the, the four points of fixation uh, uh, you can see here and we call it as a falcon construct and this is a patented technology from uh, from our institute uh, and we are using it a lot and this has given us a very good you know the outcomes in the uh, in the early onset scoliosis patients uh, again these cases they require a lot of wound healing problems the the the, uh, the repeated surgery so again a collaboration with the with your plastic surgeon is very very important and it remains a very important part of your of your practice but basically all these cases they are a teamwork and uh, i would say that a surgeon uh, we should always approach the syndromic curves with a flexible mind and you know we should be looking at the every spectrum uh, every part of the spectrum which these kids they present to us thank you well thank you babu uh... As such, EOS is difficult, but syndromic EOS is hor horrible, you know, horrendous uh, sort of area to deal with, you know. So uh, you have my sympathies and appreciation for what you're doing, you know. <laughs> we really are short of time, you know. Um, any burning question you may have, I think there are a lot of questions on the chat box. Sham has answered some of those. Uh, any other questions, one or two questions we can take before I just close this webinar? 
Um, uh, I think this webinar has been so interesting. We didn't know how the time has passed, and I would request for a complete case discussion session in the ASSI conference in, on US. That would be the part two of the webinar. Sudhir, sir, uh, please go ahead. Sir, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Go ahead, Vira. Yeah. So uh, those who are attending this webinar, I must uh, say uh, about Dr. Ashok Zohri. He's a pioneer scoliosis surgeon. When uh, even uh, when I was practicing uh, general orthopedy in 1998, he used to conduct the workshop on scoliosis. Full day workshop. That was time when I attended the uh, workshop. And at that time, he's one of the pioneer pediatric orthopedic surgeon as well to start the work of uh, scoliosis in India. So thank you, sir, for being uh, the, the organizing this such a wonderful webinar. And thanks to Arjun also. And thanks to all SC faculties. There are a couple of uh, questions. Uh, first question is to Ashish. Uh, Ashish is here? Ashish Ranade? OK. So Ashish, Ashish uh, yeah. So now uh, uh, regarding the early onset scoliosis, the what you are talking about, the pathophysiology. Uh, is there any difference in terms of uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis or maybe uh, children with neuromuscular like spastic scoliosis? Any any subtle difference you find in pathophysiology? So, uh, Virat, I understand you are asking: Is there any difference between idiopathic early onset or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, We are not seeing many idiopathic or infantile scoliosis per se. We are seeing mostly either syndromic congenital or neuromuscular and in addition to the lung pathologies they have other issues such as poor nutrition and so forth so on so uh, I, in my opinion the complexity is higher than the idiopathics where uh, it is there is no added sort of pathological problem okay a quick question to dr naresh babu uh... Sir, how do you tackle the those children who are presenting little earlier, maybe less than two years, to take the X-rays? You know, for the because they are not, we are not able to take the standing X-rays. So, how do you tackle that problem? Any any practical tip? That's what I mentioned in the talk initially. If you can't take a standing view, but we need to have a loading effect, upright effect, how the spine is behaving on the loads. So, one way is to get a sitting X-ray. The sitting x-ray can be easily done with a radiolucent table. Patient can be strapped onto the uh, chair and we can have AP and lateral views uh, in the sitting x-ray. Uh, but supporting and getting the standard is quite okay in a very little children um, uh, around two years. But if a patient is a neuromuscular patient with developmental delays, it becomes really difficult to get a standing view. But a spine can be really assessed uh, uh, the loading effect can be assessed with a uh, decent uh, sitting X-ray with custom-made uh, tables, chairs. I mean. Okay, Viraj, uh, Doctor Shivastha wants to ask a question. I think yeah. uh, we just give him uh, the you, floor. Sir. Actually, this question is to just uh, ask uh, to different uh, pediatric spine surgeons. Do you find any difference in neuromonitoring? You know, in pediatric age group, these patients and, uh, you know, adult uh, spinal deformity. So, any difference in the neuromonitoring you have noticed? So, Babu, could you want to answer that? Yeah, sure, sir. Uh, so, yes, pediatric uh, neuromonitoring becomes a challenging issue. And we are working a lot in this uh, thing. The other thing, the, the important thing is that we are using the TIVA, the uh, intravenous anesthesia. But... To, to maintain the concentration of these, uh, these you know, the, the anesthetists, it becomes a challenging issue. So that's why we are using now the TCI pumps. The, we call it the targeted control infusion pumps so that we can maintain the adequate concentration. So basically getting the baseline signals before starting the surgery and determining the exact concentration becomes very, very important in these pediatric age groups. And we have good uh, neuromonitoring, uh, you know, the experts and the anesthetists. So a good collaboration between them is very essential. The other thing is which we are now going to venture into is called the uh, the functional near, uh, near infrared spectroscopy. So this is like a 36 channel, uh, you know, the cap which you wear on the... Uh, 
on the pediatric uh, the the pa pediatric patient and then you can monitor the con the activity of the each you know the frontal mm -hmm. cortex the, uh, the this thing and then you can you know look at the uh, the actual concentration which is required uh, for the for the for the pediatric patient and the best concentration for the neuro monitoring things so a lot of things are happening but they're not uh, but yes the, definitely it is a it is a little bit challenging then as compared to the adult patient thank you well thank you Viraj, we come back to you, but just one burning question because we need to end the webinar. Yes, sir. It's a time-bound thing. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sham Kishan, a wonderful presentation. Just uh, if, if you make a large windows, so do they have any chance of going back into the rotation? Three, the windows help with the derotation of the spine. So, you take away any part of the cast that you don't need to push on the body. That's how, you know, uh, I started doing these. I learned casting from Jim Sanders and Min Mehta. That's how I started. And for a while, I was not in Min Mehta's good books because she thought I made too many big windows and I was using fiberglass for casting. But um, I found that the larger the windows are, the more the spine and the chest can derotate out. So it's never been a problem um, in fact, I don't even, you will be able to palpate the entire spine in all of my casts because the cast only supports the rib on the convexity. So the spine is allowed to kind of roll out of the cast, if you will. Thank you. Well, there were other questions to Sham, but I think he's answered them on the chat box. You know, these were dealing with neurological deterioration when casting or after casting and the time between cast and duration. So that's the answers are there on the chat box. Any questions for Ajay and Abhay? I had a, a question for Salil. So Salil, at, typically at what age do you sort of make that shift, you know, of gear to the growth rod? I mean, how, how are you able to sort of take that call? Yeah, most of the time it's uh, somewhere between five and six years of age. Um, I try to delay as much as possible, like, you know, most of the speakers were mentioning um there are some kids that have to have it at a much earlier age two or three and in those you just have to be a little bit more aggressive in driving their growth so um i i have had to use a single magnetic rod temporarily until they get big enough to insert the second one so you use different strategies to minimize the number of surgeries that they're getting but still drive their spine to control their deformity and the oldest you know like the oldest you'll do it yeah, I, I just looked back at my series for this talk, and I do have an 11 year old, which I'm ashamed to say, but very short trunk. <laughs> so uh, that child did need, uh, or I felt that the child needed a growing rod. But nowadays, I think the, you know, the the older age is getting cut down quite a bit. So somewhere between eight and ten. And and Dr. Kishan, what what is your your sort of interval between castings usually? I mean. Average. So I don't have a magic formula. I let the cast stay on for as long as possible. I don't believe in frequent cast changes. I let the child grow as much as possible. So the things I tell the parents that they have to watch out for are if the child is not able to eat as much as they eat normally and they're having to eat more frequently, it means that the cast is getting snug on their bellies. So that is one sign that I use to change the cast out but on an average probably the casts don't get changed for about between four to six months at a time for dr shetty like uh, uh, is there a weight threshold where you would do a hemiotomy like is what's your sort of is there a weight cut off you have specific as such i do not look at a specific weight but i would look at the uh, overall how is the skin of the child whether there's adequate soft tissue whether i can cover the implant I do not look at because hemivertebrectomy as such is not a very uh, significant procedure. The amount of blood loss is significantly lesser if you are going to do at one level. I look at overall development of the child rather than a particular weight. As you do a deformity correction when you are looking at a whole length. Any questions for Abhay? I think with lower profile implants, Abhay, I, I think some of these complications could be obviated, you know. So, of course, depends on what we can use, you know, in the particular case. But uh, definitely, these are complications. You know. May not be the whole rod, but the hook or the screw 
you know, end of that may become very prominent and eventually cut out. Shab, go ahead. So something just for Dr. Srivastava, he was asking about neuromonitoring. One of the things that we've been doing now, that I've been doing for the last about 10 years, is uh, we follow a protocol called an ERAS protocol. ERAS is Enhanced Recovery yeah. After Surgery. And I prep them for their pain management before surgery. So all my spine patients come to the operating room. They've been dosed preoperatively with uh, celecoxib, gabapentin, valium, and a scopolamine patch. The goal of all of this is to reduce the intraoperative and postoperative narcotic use. And then the anesthesiologists know very well how to tailor the medication. So we try to keep it very low on medications that alter your neuromonitoring. So very low gas if possible, maybe gas just to for induction and maybe a little bit of paralytic just to help exposure, but they keep it primarily on propofol and ketamine with minimal presidex, which is dexmetomidine. So um, after I expose, as soon as I can put in intrathecal duromorph, I will put in about five mics per kilo of duromorph into the spinal fluid. And after that, the child does not get any more parental narcotic. So these sorts of things that reduce the amount of anesthetic that you use. And of course, TIVA, as, as has been talked about uh, in the, uh, in the uh, presentations okay. earlier, they have really changed the anesthetic load. And Bhavak was start talking about using BIS monitors. I've used all of those things, but I find that uh, the amount of anesthetic that total amount of anesthetic that a child needs is significantly decreased if you address all of this preoperatively. I don't know if anybody else is using ERAS protocols here. I think Bhavuk mentioned something about that. Yes, you know, we, are, we are using ERAS protocols. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, I'm not, I was not talking about this thing. I'm talking about the functional ear at infra uh, spe right. spe yeah. spectroscopy yeah. so that you can look at the activity of the cortex, you know, and then you can decide the concentration of the anesthetus. The, the only thing remains that you have to, you know, be at the ideal uh, concentration of the anesthetus. So that's how you can get it. It is between anesthetist and the neurophysiologist. How can you word, you spoke on syndromic scoliosis, any word on the morbidity, mortality, you know, or your own experience? So the morbidity is definitely higher uh, in these kids. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But again, if you, uh, if you go, you know, the multidisciplinary approach, then again, it can be minimized. Mortality is definitely, uh, you know, if we look at the general population, it is definitely higher in these age groups. But I haven't found anything in my general follow-up, uh, you know, the mortality in these age groups. Okay, so thank you. I think it is time to end, Arjun. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I, I think we should be point. ending now. I would just like to sum up, you know, that we are all trading in a very difficult area where the path is not clear, you know, things are so uncertain and however well you plan, you can still land up with problems, you know. So decisions have to be based case by case and whatever best you think or whatever is the optimum treatment for that particular patient at that point in time, you know. So very challenging field, and uh, the experts who presented here really brought out each area very, very clearly and very lucidly. And I must compliment them. I must compliment ASSI and POSI both for having this webinar. It's a timely sort of alarm call, you know, that uh, this requires more coordinated management between different specialties, multidisciplinary management, you know, and long-term, keeping the long-term in mind is very, very important. So thank you all for being here today on a Sunday morning and enlightening us uh, with your vast knowledge. I think if you were to add up the combined knowledge, you know, our experience, it's more than probably 150 or 200 years, you know, seven speakers, well, each practicing for 20, 30 years would mean a lot of experience in this particular webinar. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. I, I would like Thank to end you, the webinar. I think the case discussions, we leave it for the actual conference, for a session in the actual conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank Arjun, you. when we stop recording? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we can say bye to each other. Dr. Yeah. Shivas, get on with Thank you. It was a wonderful, yeah. wonderful uh, and a session, and uh, uh, we really appreciate appreciate everyone talking so nicely well top information we got it today and uh, thanks posi all the faculties were excellent
and assi really uh, you know uh, appreciate uh, their efforts joint effort and as suggested by dr johri we should uh, do this frequently thank you very much thanks a lot thank you thank you thanks to all faculties thank yeah. you thank you we close the meeting yes sir.